Um, not so much uh, what we're doing, but I want to get to sort of two things that I think are missing right now, and what we think has been solved already, but it's probably not executed in every city, but we think it's getting much clearer uh, what, what needs to happen. So I'll rustle, I, I run through the first bit quite quickly to have a bit of time to talk about the, the new stuff. I have about 15 minutes, I think, about half an hour. Um, um, the digital agenda. Um, so, so on the program, you'll, you'll see uh, my title is still director of our IT and communications practice. It does not change to Arab Digital. Um, and it's sort, of, it's sort of part of what we're seeing here, that the, the, the old definition of IT and communications and systems where we saw it is being replaced with a new framing of, of what digital means for, for our clients, uh, but also for our own, own staff. So we have, for example, two skills networks, mine and, and another one that runs globally, that currently has about 1,800, maybe 2,000 people organized in it uh, across the 11,000 Arab staff who are all interested in what digital means to them as an individual and their skill level. You know, these are sort of quite interesting times right now we are in as a, as a firm. Um, what I was going to talk about, and the timing was quite good because I, nobody saw the slides before, but Dan sort of picked up on that. This report here was something we did with Dan um, in Melbourne about urban informatics. And I think his new picture on the, the cloud no longer being a cloud sitting above the city, but sinking down and, and um, becoming an integral part of the city as a system is exactly where we are. And I, and I just agreed with Dan before I stood up. We're going to do a new report on that uh, uh, soon. Uh, Nicola at that point looks at me and goes, oh, no, another report he agreed. <laughs> so, so, but we will. Because while we started here with an understanding of what it means for a city and what the city will look like and the experience for, for, for citizens, we then felt there were some big chunks missing between a vision and execution. And the uh, uh, information marketplace report with um, uh, Accenture and uh, some academic partners and the climate group sort of addressed the economics question primarily uh, about value creation and the second bit the issue of governance and leadership and it's not all right in there but it's probably 70 or 80 percent okay what the findings of that report were. Um, then some interesting projects and there's a much longer list I don't want to go through that and then government picked this up, and, and that is either the beginning or the end of innovation, isn't it? So, so um, the previous chairman of um, uh, GE said that. He said, oh, we've got 100 Nobel Prizes and 100 awards and 100 patents every week registered around the world, and we know we're on an old trend when the White House calls us in and asks us for a meeting about a trend. Um, I don't think that's the case here, actually. I think these were genuine attempts by by UK government, and we see it internationally too, to understand both the scale of the opportunity, which I'll come to in a second, and the second one, their role. I think they're no longer saying um, this might or might not happen, you know, smart city, dumb city, don't really care. But this issue of a digital economy, I think, is completely center stage now in government. And with devolution in the UK, it will become complete center stage in the UK cities. There's no doubt in my mind. Uh, if you watch the, um, um, the Dimbleby speech um, by, yes, Martha Lane Fox, that was excellent, you know, and it lifted the debate to the right level uh, where we need to be, and I think the UK Institute for Digital uh, that, she, that she sort of asked for there at the level of the NHS or the BBC would be, would be fantastic. So I think government is now on board, they just don't know what their role is. Yeah? And, and one of the reasons they uh, uh, are on board is that they want to be part of this 40 billion market. There was a study for uh, BIS that looked at market opportunities both in the UK and internationally. So instead of having another, I think there's currently about 300,000 jobs in the um, financial sector in, the, in London, instead of having another 300,000 jobs in finance, clearly now they want to have another 150,000 jobs in the tech industry. Um, and that's not just government, there's also stakeholders like Canary Wharf Group who are very actively chasing tech industry for the Woodwolf development. So we see this across the industry, or across the spectrum in cities now, that people are saying digital and tech is a core part of the future of the city. And, and we know how it works. You know, it is, it is relatively straightforward. You know, you're just going to have this sort of new layer of, of instrumentation and digitalization. You, know, you create data 
where Dan shot so nicely, no longer in a cloud, but in the streets, on the lampposts, in parking spaces, in building management systems, everywhere. You know, um, we're just trialing here about 100 sensors, um, and, and one of the new Texas Instruments ones is uh, humidity, location, it measures everything. You know. Uh, Moore's law, quite simple, $20 today, $10 next year, $5 the year after. At that point, that technology would be embedded in anything that is connected. Uh, at that point, we'd either use power over Ethernet or other network technologies to make it easy to connect, and we'll have an unbelievable, an unbelievable digital sort of layer uh, uh, being available to do something with. And what we then will see is a change not just at a hardware level or when we had um, IP coming in at a sort of telecoms level, we see innovation happening from the instrumentation, the sensing where the payload is generated through new operational and IoT layers through IT, completely new platforms emerging right now, uh, developing analytics and visualization business that didn't exist yesterday to a whole raft of presentation layers that will target both operational efficiencies and the experience of users and citizens. And it's the innovation across the entire stack that is so exciting. And, and I think that is a reason why right now people are still over imagining the next 12 months. So this will not all happening by the end of, uh, what are we now, 2015. But by the end of 2020, uh, in the next five years, all of this will be available and working. So, so the risk, I think, for us is that we are over imagining the short term, as usual, but under imagining the, the, the medium to, to longer term. What the cities and the built environment where we work in have, have as a special case in here is that we don't just want data out. So the principle of cost, friction, machine integration, search, and secure and trustworthy data out um, has to work with control uh, back into the system. So, um, and, and that's an important point. So, Getting real-time data into super high-rise buildings to plan lift, lifts more effectively has a big impact on the, on the effectiveness of buildings that are a kilometer tall, uh, people tell me. Um, and they call it vertical transport instead of lifts. But when you're in the lift, having, let's say, 80% accuracy for that data is probably not what people want. Um, <laughs> so so there, is a, there, is a, there is a serious issue around building not just data out models, but complete loops uh, uh, in the data environment of the built environment. That's less relevant for the parking sensor that I showed, but it becomes relevant for a lot of the systems that we're trying to, to use in a digital context. And the business model is getting clearer too. So a parking sensor enabling a driver to find a parking space is one thing. Scaling that up so that all parking spaces are available via some sort of mechanism, and that's not decided yet how we're going to do that, um, scales up this business quite significantly and the opportunity quite significantly, creates real business models for startups like could be Transport API, but I think there will be new business models emerging here too. Now all of a sudden you have all the parking data of the city available in our um, command and control centers for transport planners and, and instead of just solving parking, we make a contribution to road disruption which could be a 700 million cost, for example, one, one city, because we are tracking congestion linked to parking being full. Now, that data being put out will then create other external, externalities in the city where we create jobs while people mashing up and aggregating data layers in the city in ways that we currently can't do. I think that model is now pretty well understood by, by those who've been working in the industry for a while, and we're seeing very interesting businesses, both large and small, growing on the back of that model. The barrier that we saw in the past is also now understood. So the focus on hard infrastructure, you know, turning these sort of systems improvements that I showed into technology projects, you always get stuck uh, unless you address the soft infrastructure, which is governance, strategic or vision, citizen engagement in cities. You know, I think we spoke about that earlier. Cities belong to citizens, not to employees or shareholders or, you know, so, so you have to have citizen engagement clear. Uh, and how do you measure value? But we now see several cities working quite hard on creating these governance frameworks here, the soft infrastructure here, which I think then will rocket fuel innovation and increase of soft technology solutions down there. Um, and, and I'll come back to what the ODI will do with us uh, in, in that next, Tom. Yeah, yeah. 
you're, you're smiling not much longer. Um, <laughs> that leads to, to how do we pay for it? I think that's also much clearer now. Um, a, a recent report, I don't I remember who the partners were for that, um, the user collaborative reports. Uh, Nicola knows. She's a, Nicola's in the corner there, so she is one of the authors together with Lane. Is Lane here too? No. But ask Nicola, she knows who, who wrote the report with us. We're starting to see in there also much clearer now that cities are already spending 6% um, of their budgets on technology. We then did a separate piece of work around embedded digital budgets in capital projects and infrastructure. Uh, and that is another 6%, sometimes going up to 10 or 12% on, on, on certain projects. So, so in cities, they constantly renew their transport infrastructure, their buses, their water utilities. If you take that new digital layer and the 6% they already spend, it doesn't need a lot more on top to pay for a digital economy in your city. So I think the money issue is also sorted. Yeah? Um, he says optimistically. Um, <laughs> And then why bother? Well, that's getting clearer too. You know, we know now that the mayor of Rio is primarily focused on how the digital city will change the political structure, and, and he calls it polis digistocracy, just, just to make it easy and snappy and roll off the tongue, I think. Um, so the polis digistocracy that he's talking about is about reaching every citizen or having engagement at a completely new level between political leadership and the city. Uh, uh, and we see that in democratic structures, but we also see that in countries that are perhaps less democratic, where people all of a sudden have a voice, and that voice will be, will be heard. Obviously, all the functional stuff people always talked about, transport, water, uh, uh, electricity, grid optimization, you know, it goes on. I, I don't think I've come across a single optimization or efficiency project that didn't have a digital component in it in the last five years. So there's loads there. Environmental, uh, I cannot see how we're going to get uh, an understanding of water consumption into every person's individual behavior without tr some transparency on what they're consuming. I think Australia proven that through their work of around water awareness, and the same will apply to energy and waste and carbon and other critical resources, that once that is transparent, what you as an individual can do and what your role is, you know, it will change. Uh, we had yesterday a great discussion with the Commonwealth leaders um, in, in somewhere. Um, uh, in, in, I'll, I'll, it will come back. Um, and, and one of the projects, they had a week to think about smart cities. Um, delegation from, from the whole Commonwealth, about 130 people, apparently representing 2.2 billion people. No idea how big the Commonwealth was. I guess as a German, that's excusable. Anyway, one of the projects they came up with was, was um, uh, uh, the idea that every product anybody ever buys or consumes, people will comment on in a new social enterprise they're going to set up to point out whether that is socially a good product or a bad product. Not, not organized by government, but by individuals on their phone voting and commenting and saying, you know, we think these products are too sugary, or these, pr these products have too much carbon content in it, or these products are, are not good for society the way we see it. You know, really exciting ideas. And, and they, they worked through it for a week, and they think they could do this for about two billion people. So there are some interesting ideas around environmental improvement coming. Clearly, this will be the second biggest driver after political, I think. The, the job opportunity of a digital economy is just too too big and too promising to not be the prime driver for our political leaders. At a city scale, social and care or social and health care has to be baked in now, so I'm getting timed off. And it has to be humane, which I'll come back to in a, in a second. So two things I want to point out. One is, this is the digital ecosystem of London as we mapped it, as some work with it on the Smart London Board. And I didn't want to go through it. I just want to show the complexity of how many people are involved in London's digital economy. If I then look at the value chain work we did in information marketplaces, you can very quickly see the idea that bringing all this data into new operations and experience, having city uh, transport API emerging here, having city mapper emerging here, creating jobs, that is all well and good. But the problem is the architecture we currently use doesn't scale when you put that on top. You know, imagine you are a business here, 
managing the hundreds, if not thousands, of APIs to, to drive their business. Imagine you then take that globally. So there's a big piece missing as a digital reference architecture, either in, in verticals like transport or energy, or at a city scale, and Tom is going to solve that with us. So, so that's why I was really, really delighted that the ODI is going to put their might behind it. And we want to do it with them and others. We'd like to create a group around this, so the digital catapult with their secure data uh, activities, I think, is another very important player in that. But some sort of semantic framework, some ontology, is most likely needed, we think, to, to solve that. We just don't know exactly what it is, but, but Tom knows, so we are in safe hands there. The, the second, so this was my second bit that's missing. The first bit that is missing, which, um, where was that? Which we want to push, is not just to have a statement like the Smart London Plan that we have right now, but something where we get, certainly for the election, for the next election here, but for all UK cities, a, a digital manifesto into the political leadership of every city. And that's the second thing we want to push with the ODI and as many others who are interested in helping it. As we have no party political interest, this is no party political broadcast, but we think every political leader should have a digital manifesto in their manifesto. And if they don't, then they should explain why they don't, um, which is fair enough too in the, in the system we work in. But that's the second thing we want to do this year with the ODI. And the London elections are coming up, so they're probably a good one to, to uh, start. So, in conclusion, um, and the miracle occurs, you know, good work, but I think we might need just a little more detail right here. I think a lot of the detail has already been solved around governance, finance, da 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 da, da. The two things that are missing for me is the political leadership, and the second one is the reference architecture that allows to scale. And then we will see this, 100,000 more jobs, 10% less resource consumption, 15% less carbon produced, 8.5% reduction in social and care cost, completely new mobility, not dependent on car, a poorless digitocracy, you know, call the mayor of Rio, what he means by that, no, no, better engagement with citizens. Um, with privacy and trust, this is probably some of the biggest things sort of creeping into this now. If we really see this digitalization happening the way I talked about it, privacy and trust will become a massive issue. And the business model of the incumbent social media search and, and internet firms will come, will come under pressure too. And at that point, I assume they'll start to lobby against some of the ideas that we have around open data, for example, or, or secure data, um, and, and many more. I don't think this is the list of all seven, um, but it's not a start. The problem with that list is I've made it up. You know, these figures are not real, but we will have, I promise, within a year's time, at least three UK cities who will have that level of clarity, together with the digital manifesto, of what they want to achieve as outcomes in their city. And, and I think that would be quite, quite cool. That's all. Thank you.